Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free? Who is free? Caves in there. Go ahead. Yes. Sorry about that. Isn't it good to be in God's house today? I was thinking about this song, uh, had a request to do this, and I was thinking about my old buddy sitting right up here. Isn't it good that we got somebody that we can lean on? And the name of the song is I Can't Even Walk Without You Holding My Hand. And what about our lost loved ones? What do, what do they think about? You know what I'm saying? On, in their trials. And we've all lost loved ones. I lost my mother and uh, uh, lost lots of aunts. And 
but what would it be like if you knew you wouldn't see them again? You know what I'm saying? So I thank God every day that I can't even walk without him holding my hand. Is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God.
wide awake while the web is sound asleep Too afraid of all my show up while you're dreaming Nobody, nobody, nobody sees you Nobody, nobody will believe you Every day you try to pick up all the pieces All the memories they somehow never leave ya Nobody, nobody, nobody sees you Nobody, nobody will believe you God only knows what you've been through God only knows what they say about you God only knows the reason in you Is there a color of that? God only knows what you've been through God only knows what they say about you God only knows what's kicking you Is there a kind of love that God only knows God only knows what you've been through God only knows what they say about you God only knows what's kicking you Is there a kind of love that God only knows He's an awesome God, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Yeah. Y'all ain't ever seen this much. Huh?
You know, sometimes you can walk out on a limb where you shouldn't be and it's going to break with you. And that's about what we're fixing to do right now, Daryl. <laughs> Nobody's played this song. We had never practiced this song. But this song has been on my heart all week. No, I may not do it right. There's one thing you can depend on. When you try to do something for the Lord, no matter how it turns out, the world will look at you and say, boy, that's a mess. God looks at you and says, thank you for at least trying. We have so many today that don't even try. And I've got two things I want you to do. First, I want you to take a minute and look all around you. Really, look around, look around. Because what you're going to see is you're going to see loved ones. You're going to see church members. You're going to see old folks. You're going to see young folks. You're going to see everybody you love. But all of this boils down to one word while we're in this house. Distraction. Yeah, that's my wife, but if I pay attention more to her than I do Daryl, she's become my distraction. So I want to ask you to do one other thing, and I know there's going to be some of y'all out there that says, this is silly. This was stupid. Why did he even say this? But I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to close your eyes. Daryl won't tell you this during preaching, so I got to do it now. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to meditate on God. And as we try to sing this song, just keep your eyes closed where you're at and think about what the song says. Don't think about how Roger sings it. Please think about the song. Think back to the time when Jesus saved you. Think back to the time when Jesus saved your soul. Remember the joy. Oh. 
awesome, man. Let these babies go. Wow. That's a lot of fun to watch. I mean, it really is. <laughs> That's a lot of fun to watch, seeing them babies go out. Good morning, guys. Good, good to see y'all. Uh, first, I want to start off by saying I thank the men for the preparation and everything they did yesterday for the, the ladies to have an evening where they're, they're basically they're pampered and done the way that Christ has done the church, the men to love the ladies of their life, their wives in that way. And I'm thankful for that. It was a great success. Uh, had one of the best compliments, church, that you could possibly be given. The lady that spoke, Miss Sally Guest, that spoke last night, said that this was as close to home as uh, she's ever experienced in a church. She said everybody was so loving she had never seen anything like it. That's a great compliment. That's a great compliment, guys, because that means that you let Jesus' love be seen through your work and in, in, in what you've done. And there's no greater compliment than to be in Christ and His will and to be doing as He sees fit, not how we would do it, but as He would do it. And, you, and guys, I appreciate you. Ladies, thank you for showing up and allowing the men a chance of servitude, just as Christ served the church. Men had that opportunity to serve last night, and it was an absolute blessing. It was an absolute blessing. And ladies, we hope you really enjoyed it. Oh, amen. Amen. I know time we got to the to the cake and stuff. Oh, and they seen the strawberries and all that on the cake. There was some eyes that big around. It was awesome to see. We we really did have a good time. I told David my hands are shaking off this morning. I'm nervous. The Lord is just really working on me. You know, last week we we preached on uh, standing up for the Lord and standing up in His power and His might. As I told you guys. I'm not about, I, I'm a recruiter for the Lord, not as in I can't save anybody, but my recruitment is to share the gospel with people, right, and to share the truth. And one of the things that has been ironed over is the guys thinking that you're being sissies about coming to church. And we do that. The world portrays a Christian man as being a weakling. There is not a stronger man walking than a firm Christian man in the Lord. Let me, let me reiterate that to the highest degree. There's not, a, there's not a stronger man walking than that that has turned his life over to the Lord. And the reason I know that, it says it will stand in the power of his might. It isn't because that guy is something special. He can't, you know, I don't care if he can go out and lift the side of a car up. That ain't the kind of strong I'm talking about. I'm talking about one that can go through the spiritual fire, that can go through turmoil and problems going on here, and he don't turn to the bottle, he don't turn to drugs, he turns to Christ, and in turn, Christ strengthens him. He's able to defeat some things that he, by himself, that he couldn't. So standing up for Christ, you know, I asked you a question last week, I said, what's wrong with being a Christian? What is, what's wrong? Somebody, somebody explain to me, because the world would have us believe we're bigots and and, and, and racist, and you just name it. You can, you can attach any derogatory term that you want to, to the name Christian and the world wants you to believe that they're just, they're, you know, they don't accept anybody. No, we don't accept sin, but we accept everybody, but not to sin. We got to understand that there's a, there's a separation there. And what I'm going to read this morning to, to start with is a little bit of verse, and then we're going to jump back over to Ephesians 6. But I want to read just a little bit about out of, out of Isaiah, Isaiah 59, as a matter of fact, that we're going to get to around, I think, the 15th verse. I'll have to go back over there and look. But what is wrong with being a man of God? What is wrong, what's wrong with you being a woman of God? Is there embarrassment there? No. Is there embarrassment in, in, in you standing up for the Lord? Well, we tend to shy away a lot of times, like we're almost embarrassed on who, who we're supposed to be in Christ. And guys, I've told you, the apostles that he called 
if you will study the man that God has called to do his bidding in the Scripture, them some of the baddest dudes walking. I mean, Peter and them, you don't get no rough. Hey, if you'll pull a sword out and chop a guy's ear off because of, that he's going to try to take your leader with him, and I, I will guarantee you that Peter wasn't aiming for that man's ear. If they hadn't jerked Malchus out of the way, I believe he'd have got him across the neck. I do. I believe he meant to do damage. Peter was rough around the edges, but you know what? He was given a blessing. That man got to preach the first sermon of the church. Amen. You know why? Not because Peter was a good old boy. It was because he put his faith in Christ. Guys, there is nothing wrong with being a firm Christian in your walk. As a matter of fact, there's everything right about that. You know, I, I, get, I get a lot of young folks that tell me, well, we just want to be different. We want to be different. You know, I, I see the hair color, and you know, you go from everything, from blues to pinks to whatever. You know, I used to tell girls all the time, that because I love to see long, flowing, beautiful hair, I do. I'm scared to tell them now because I don't know what's real and what ain't. You know, you might walk up and tell them, man, you've got beautiful hair. Yes, my weaves. What? You know, what? I don't even try to tell them anymore because I don't know. You know? But we look on those things, we want to look pretty on the outside. Man, the Lord wants us to be beautiful on the inside, right? He wants us to be saved, but he wants us to be firm. Well, he wants us to stand our ground in Christ and not back up. And there ain't a thing wrong with it. It's everything is right with it. Right here, Israel. Israel had been through a lot of stuff, had done a lot of things, had separated himself. If you read in the first couple of verses in 59, he said, My arm is not short that I can't reach you. My ear is not dull that I can't hear you. But your sin and your iniquity has put a separation between me and you. See, sin does that. It separates us from God, right? But I, this is not just any armor, and I'm fixing to prove it in Scripture. In studying this week, did you know this armor? How many of you want to go out in something? How many of you football players would want to go out in a helmet that's unproven? You don't know if it's going to break on the first contact. Maybe your shoulder pads. Maybe when you hit, to hit hard, they're just going to shred. It's not going to protect that shoulder. And you're going to be going through surgery on the shoulder. Just because it wasn't. Well, this, this armor that I want to preach to you about this morning, the Lord's laid it on my heart, is tried and true armor. It's been worn by God himself. Did you know that? When he says take on the whole armor of God, it ain't a figure of speech. And I'm going to prove it right here in chapter 59, starting with verse 15 in Isaiah. Listen to this. 
Yea, truth faileth. And he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it. Now, the Lord saw it. So we know who we're talking about, right? The Lord. And it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness. It sustained him. Listen. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. See, God has tried this armor I want to preach to you about this morning. It's tried and true. He put on the breastplate, and it says he put on the helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with a zeal as a cloak. This armor that I want to preach to you about in Ephesians chapter 6 has been tried and seen to be true by God himself. He put it on. Said the Lord put on the armor. So this morning, if we're going to stand up and be who we are in Christ, who we're supposed to be, we're not only going to need his power and might, we're going to need to make sure that we're clothed correctly. And he starts out in, in, in verse 14 of chapter 6 of Ephesians. He, he starts out, and y'all don't have to stand or nothing because I just, like I said, man, my hands are shaking off right now. I'm just jittery. And I, we're not going to slow down. We're going to bail on into it. It says in, in, in verse 14, well, let me just go back and read 10 through 20 for you just to re, re, rekindle the fire from last week of understanding. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Stand up. Be strong in his power and in his might. Put on the whole armor of God. We're going to preach on that. That you may be able to stand against the wiles or the plans of the devil. Now listen closely. We think that our problem is somebody down the road. We think our problem with the church is, well, so-and-so goes down there at Pleasant Hill. He's a hypocrite. I'm as good as he is. You're exactly right. You're as good as he is. Yes, that man's got sin in his life. But if that's standing between you and God, he's closer to the Lord than you are. You need to understand that. Because that's just an excuse. Amen? For who we're supposed to be. But listen to where the enemy's really at. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So that takes all men and women out of the equation. They can't be our excuse for being out in sin. We're not wrestling them. We're wrestling against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Again, the tried and true armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, you've done everything you can to stand up in his power and mind. He said, now do this. He said, because I want to strengthen you for the fight that's coming. I want to strengthen it for the day that they look on you and they call you a bigot or a sissy or whatever. My teenagers, man, y'all want to be different with the blue hair and all of that? That's cool. I ain't got a problem with it. I, I don't. There's a lot of people jump up and down over it. I don't. That, that's up to y'all. But if y'all want to be different in, in high school... You want to be different at Phil Campbell, Thark Pound, Russell, wherever you at? Try being a Christian. You'll be different than the norm. I guarantee you, you'll be different because straight as the gate and there's a way for you to be the dinner in. You're going to be outnumbered. But I got news for you. It just because you're outnumbered don't mean that, you got, that you're easy prey because if you'll stand in the power of his might and put on this armor, there's nothing that can defeat you. You understand that? It said you'll be more than conquerors in Christ. Amen? And so first, what do we do? How do we put on the armor? Well, the first thing we got to have, we got to have a belt. we got to have a belt. Now, man, I don't know about y'all, but it's a wrestling match with me with belts. It is. It's a wrestling match all the time because, see, I, I, hey, I call it like it is. My gut is way bigger, Brett, that you don't understand this, son. You look young, slender, you ain't put on no fat. You don't get all this. Older guys, you, you understand where I'm coming from, brother, right? But my gut is bigger than it should be. So if y'all notice my belt, look, I, I'm telling y'all, and I'm telling them, because if I pick on one of y'all, Chase, if I picked on you, you're a lot bigger than me, I'd be scared to pick on you, right? You understand? So I pick on me, that way nobody can see it. But my belt is generally stretched in them holes. You know why? Because I'm always cinching because my belly pushes my pants down. 
when I'm walking, right? And if I take that belt, boy, and I pull that dude up and I'll cinch it down, I've got a few minutes. Of, uh, it ain't relief, but my pants is up, right? Amen? Well, see, that's the way it is in our spiritual life. We laugh about it, but everything starts with the inner core. You want to be a good athlete? You need an inner core that's strong. You need a strong center part of your body because all the other muscles is going to rely on that core being strong. And the same thing happens with our spiritual life. Our spiritual life must be strong at its core. So at the core of our, of our spiritual life, it tells me to take on a belt. It tells me to gird about myself with a belt, and that belt is called what? Truth. Truth. See, I don't have to back up. I don't have to make excuse. I don't have to conjure up 14 other lies to cover a different lie. If I'll just stay in the truth, I may make somebody mad, but they can't refute it because it's the truth. And the truth is who? In John 14 and 6, Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the belt that I need that centers up everything, this armor is no good to me unless I have a belt because it centers up everything. And you know what they do in the time that they're talking about, these soldiers and everything, they had these long robe-like garments, right? And they got that belt, and they cinch that belt on when they was getting ready to go to war. And they'd cinch that belt on tight. Well, they'd reach and grab the back of that garment, bring it up between their legs, bring it up through that belt, and wrap it over, and all of a sudden the thighs and the legs are free to fight. You understand? They couldn't run in them long garments without getting tripped up. They couldn't move and do the things they needed to do in battle and wield the sword. First off, if they didn't have the belt, where's the sword attached? Well, I dropped it back up there. It does you a lot of good, don't it, to drop the sword back there when the fight is heating up right here where you're at. So see, the belt not only held the sword, it held everything together. It frees a man up where he can stand his ground in the Lord. And that's because if we'll stand on truth, we have a great starting point. And the truth is Jesus Christ died for us all. The truth is that he's the son of God. The truth is that he died on the cross. The truth is he rose the third day. The truth is he stands as intercessor. The truth is he is the way. The truth is he is the life. The truth is if a man's going to be saved, it won't be because he's a good old boy. It won't be because he morally cleaned himself up. It'll be because he put his faith in the truth, Jesus Christ. So see, we've got to have that part first. We've got to have that strong inner core. We've got to have that, guys. And the only way that you're going to get it is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't try to clean your life up. Don't try to clean anything up. Put your faith in him. Let him be the housekeeper. Let him. He said, because I will indwell you. Not only will I indwell you, he said, I'll keep my commandments in front of your eyes like the, like the platelets, just like the, the children of Israel. He said, as a matter of fact, I won't even put them in front of you. I'll just imprint them on your heart. Amen. Amen. See, that's the way he cleans us up. Man can't clean himself up. Man can't come to Christ. The only thing he wants for you to do, lost man, is to put your faith in him. Will you believe the truth? Will you believe the truth? That's all he's asking of you. Because if a man will put his faith in the truth and he starts studying that truth, that man named Jesus, his life, it's amazing how clean it gets. Because we want to be more like Christ every day. You know, I shared with somebody this week, again, and I say it over and over, uh, the group here at Pleasant Hill get, get tired of hearing it probably after a while, but the mirror that you want to look in to see how your Christian life's going is right here. It ain't your wife sitting across the table from you or on the couch with you. It ain't your kids that's growing up that you walk in there and you see them asleep and they look so sweet and stuff. It ain't that old guy down the road. It ain't that preacher. It ain't the one on TV. It's none of them. You compare your life to this right here and you'll know where you stand every time. Amen. Because you know why? Jesus Christ is this word. Jesus Christ is the truth. You got to have a strong central core, buddy. It don't get any stouter than this. It don't get any stronger than this. The next thing that it tells us, it tells us that, that, that the truth will, will absolutely, it will set us free. John 8, 32. If you, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. What does it make us free of? It makes us free from the encumbrances of sin. It makes us free from the encumbrances of sin. To know the truth, to have faith in the truth, have that intimate relationship. Sin, guys, is destroying us. 
Sin's destroying countries. It's destroying the world. It destroys nature. It destroys all aspects of creation. Do you understand that? Sin will get in your life, and it'll cost you way more than you're ever willing to pay. Amen? If you go on and read over there where I was at in Isaiah, it talks about the Lord being dressed with the, the seal and the cloak of judgment. And he talks about judgment coming. And he said that man will be rewarded or paid for his deeds. I got news for you. I don't want to be paid for my deeds. I want to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. Amen? Because if I'm given what I deserve, I'm going to burn in hell. But if I put my faith in Christ and I'm redeemed by his blood, I have a home on high. It's that simple. See, there's the truth again. Ain't that amazing? When you stand on the truth, you can stand firm. You can stand strong. The next thing he asked us to do over there in Ephesians, he asked us to take on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, everybody knows what a breastplate is. Breastplate for a soldier and stuff. You know, they wrap around, and what they do is they really, they give you cover for the internal organs that can get you killed. If you get stabbed in the arm and stuff like that, they... You tend to get that bandage, you know, stabbed or cut in the legs or whatever. But now you get stabbed up in that torso, man, most likely you're a dead man. Well, here's the cool part. God, again, has already had this breastplate of righteousness. We, we covered that in, uh, in Isaiah 59. But he says, won't you just take mine? Now, what is righteousness? Righteousness is declared free from the condemnation of sin. Right? That's righteousness. That's what it is, is to be, there's there, therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You, we, we are imputed his righteousness because of our faith. Nothing else. Yeah, it ain't because I, I'm a good old boy. It ain't because we served the women last night, done something great in the church. It ain't got a thing to do with my performance. It's got everything to do with my faith. And that Savior named Jesus, well, why wouldn't I want to wear his breastplate? And listen to this. Righteousness by the dictionary, free from guilt of sin. <laughs> That's good. Free from the guilt of sin. Uh, how many people do you meet? That, that and, and man, I meet them all the time. You, Brother Darrell, you just don't know what all I've done. I don't have to know. I don't want to know. I don't. God already knows, right? Now, here's the good part for that old guy. And they don't never believe it. You just don't know what all I've done. I just don't see how Christ can forgive me. <laughs> well, glory to God. Everything to do with salvation is because it's a gift. He's not expecting anything from you in return. He didn't give you the gift of salvation expecting you to repay him. All he, gave, he gave that gift simply because he loves you. Don't matter where you're at, man. Oh, wouldn't you want to stand for a leader like that? I don't know about you, Tyler, but I'll stand up for a man that'll die on the cross for me. Amen? I'll fight for the man that died on the cross for me and to share his gospel. Woo, I'm telling you. They won't, Christians ain't sissies, guys. Man, let's get that out of our head. Let's be strong in the Lord. Let's go to this war. Let's put our head up and get in it, eh? You know what I'm saying? Genesis 15 and 6 says that Abram had believed on the Lord and the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. Y'all see how that works? Simply believing in him, he counts it righteousness. What's the righteousness? In other words, he believed in the Lord and the Lord counted him forgiven. Guilt-free. Man, does it get any better than that? Y'all know any better deals than that? Amen. Y'all are quiet. What's the deal? I love you. There's three of you. That's two more than last week, Roger. See, y'all can laugh in church. It's okay, I promise. I promise. Romans 1 and 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And it's written, the just shall live by faith. Y'all see how this is working? Now, this righteousness, this breastplate is going to protect what? Heart and soul. Amen? It protects heart and soul. In other words, 
if the Lord's imputed his righteousness on me and I have this breastplate there, when God looks on me, he don't see the sinner man that I was. He sees the blood of his son and he sees the righteousness of Jesus on me. Amen? So when he looks on me, all he sees is a forgiven man. He doesn't see all that old sin. Man, ain't that the best place to be? Ain't it good to lay your head down on the pillow and not have all those tons of regret over your sin flowing back in your head? Ain't it great to serve one that says, I will take your sin and I will throw it as far as the east is from the west. He said, I'll put it like it's at the bottom of the ocean where it'll never be seen again. I'll put it in a spot behind me in the center of my back and I'll never look on your sin again. Isn't that a great place to be? How many of you go to bed with regrets every night? We do, don't we? We go to bed with them regrets. Would you know God doesn't intend for you to live that way? Jesus Christ wants your joy full. He does not intend for you to go to bed with all those regrets, all that looking back. Look, past is past. There ain't a thing you can do about it, but what you can do is for your future and your eternal future is put your faith in the truth and let him impute his righteousness on you and wear that breastplate where that soul is protected from now on. Amen. Man, ain't it awesome how this armor works? I love it. And one, and I've always, I'll be honest, I've always kind of looked over this one just a little bit because it talks about the feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I kind of, you know, I, under, I understood it a little bit, but when I got to looking at that word preparation, let me read, read the, the scripture right quick for you. This is found in 15, uh, Ephesians 6 and 15. He says, and have your feet shod with the preparation, that's a key word right there, the preparation of the gospel of peace. That word preparation means a prepared and firm foundation. It means a prepared and a firm foundation. Who prepared it? I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. So who's doing the preparing? Jesus. He's prepared a firm foundation. The gospel. The gospel of peace. Not a gospel of where God is going to arm up in his, in his cloak of zeal and bring on judgment. He says, I'm preparing a place of peace for you. How many of you would love to have just complete peace in your mind and heart right now? Right now, just a calmness that surpasses all understanding, that peace being there. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about putting your faith in the truth of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, imputed righteousness where you're not guilty of your sin. And he's talking about being able to talk and tell people about the good news, the gospel that is of peace. It's not a condemnation. I told you, we don't need to beat people over the head over their sin with the Bible. That is not what it is. You will not change a man's life beating him. You can beat him from, from the time he's born till he dies, and all you're going to do is make an enemy. But if you show him love, you'll gain a friend. Amen? Same way it works with our spiritual life. And that, and that preparation and the shod, the word shod, I love it comes from the Roman. Y'all know how I am on history. I love studying history. With the Roman soldiers, and I found out this actually goes back to Samaritan, Samarian soldiers. Man, we're going on back now. We're getting on way on back. Now, we're getting pre-flood type things. But they have record that this came from teaching down through centuries that that shod means to take a pair of shoes. Chase, it means to take a, a pair of shoes on the feet. And what the Roman soldiers done to kind of put it in context, and I alluded to this a little bit last week, they drove nails through it. And then they put skins over it where the nail heads wouldn't come back up. But that way, when they formed that phalanx that I talked about, and a phalanx is just a line of men lined up, and they're in kind of a rectangle. And those men use their shields. They, the, the front ones and the side ones use the shields on the ground. The other ones used the shields overhead to keep arrows from falling in on them. But they could move in that phalanx and just destroy an army. And they got the guys back there in the middle, and they got these big, so, or big spears, and they're hitting people. As they come up to that phalanx, that they're at the shield, they're just killing them. And the phalanx is moving. 
Well, they had to have something, Gary, when people hit them. If, if 10,000 against 10,000, you got to get a footing. How many of you have played line in football? How many of you have been lineman? Raise your hand high for me. Lineman, lineman, lineman. I got some lineman. Does it matter whether you get a good grip or not when that old boy across from the line fires off on you? Does it matter if your cleats hold or not? Because you get abused if it don't. It's just that simple. And then when you're in the film room with all the team and stuff and somebody's just constantly sliding you back, you look like you're on a sled, your team's going to make fun of you. That's, a, that's just the way it works. But you see what matters is those soldiers would put those nails there where they got a good grip. And what the Lord's doing is saying, take the shoes that I'm going to give you. Those shoes are planted on a prepared and a firm foundation. It's like digging in, man, with that right foot. You've seen the kids, man, they just burn it at the batter's box. You'll start out in the batter's box in the game with it just this level. And by the time they get through digging and doing all of that, you got a hole about that deep, right? Because they think that's going to help them, you know, when the whole time their right foot can't turn or twist. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked, going after that squirrel out on that limb again. But he wants us to dig in. And he don't want us to do it with anything other than the gospel. He wants us to dig in. In other words, I'm not going to come and beat on Gage about sin. I'm going to share the word of God with him. I'm going to share the good news that he can be forgiven. I'm going to share the good news that Jesus died on the cross for him. I'm going to share the good news that Jesus loves him, right? See, I can dig into that, man. I can put my foot down on that and not worry about slipping because there's no slippage in the gospel of Christ. So here I am. I got my, my loins are girt about with a belt of truth, so everything is kind of holding in a composure. Then I've got the righteous imputed because I got that breastplate on. So my, my soul's protected because it said that once that God has a grip on me, there's nothing, there's nothing that can take me away from him. So, I, man, I, I can stand on that. I can put my foot down and hold my ground. Amen? See, there ain't no sissy stuff in, in Christianity. It's all about standing up and being for Christ and loving people. Well, <clears throat> you tell another guy you love him? What, you queer or something? You tell another guy you love him? You gay? Guys, I got news for you. God told us in the scripture real plain. He said, you're going to love the Father first. He and the Father are one. But you better love your fellow man. Yeah, I'm going to tell a guy I love him. You bet I am. See, we get all crossed up thinking on the sexuality terms. See, that's, the, that's the, the, the worldly way. True love is a sacrificial thing when you would help somebody when they're down, when you wouldn't want to see your worst enemy go to hell. There's some true love involved there. You bet you I love you. You bet you I love you. Amen? As far on the homosexuality, I don't know that there's a gay man or woman in this world that I don't love. The sin, I don't. And I'll preach against it. And I'll tell them, hey, there's a Savior out there that will save you, that will change your life, that will help you. But they're no different than me. They're no different than me. I don't care what anybody says. We're to love them and to share the gospel of peace. 1 Corinthians explains this gospel of peace and, and, and having our feet our, our feet really, really prepared, you know, this, this foundation that's been prepared for us and having our feet really compressed down to it. 1 Corinthians 3 and 9 says, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, listen, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation, listen, there's no foundation that no man can lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. It ain't in man, it's in Christ. That foundation. Put your foot down on that. Now, if we go to 16, we're going to take the shield of faith. Man, 
this is the one thing that justifies me in you. What does justify mean? It means that when God looks on me, he can accord me and give me salvation without, without breaking the law. That's as simple as I know how to put it, without breaking the law. What do you mean without breaking the law? I mean that because I couldn't keep the Ten Commandments, because I put my faith in the Lord, that God can forgive me of not keeping the Ten Commandments, even though I'm guilty, because I'm justified because I believe in His Son. That's all. Don't add nothing to that. Not that I'm justified because I believe in His Son and I go to church every Sunday. Look, I think you ought to be in church every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Why? Because we, we use it to glorify the Lord, and we use it to grow from, and it strengthens. No other reason not to get you to heaven. If you think coming to Pleasant Hill going to get you to heaven, good luck. Good luck. You'll come to Pleasant Hill because you have a home on high, because you are saved, and you're going to want to worship. That's why you'll come. Amen? Amen. But he tells us to take on this shield of faith. Faith is complete trust in someone or something. It's putting our trust in God. Y'all see how he's done, Roger? He's prepared us. He's covered us in righteousness. He's put us on a firm foundation, and he's handed us a shield of faith. What does the shield do? It protects us from all kind of things that can be thrown our way. How many of you get some fiery darts? Have y'all had any fiery darts this week? Have you had some things that just took wind out of your sail threw at you this week? Have you had some things that just flabbergasted you? You say, man... Have you done some things and said some things to some people? And right, I mean, you didn't even get it out of your mouth good till you regretted it. I mean, the echo of what you said hadn't even finished and you had that regret. That's these fiery darts. We have to put faith in Christ that he'll forgive us. It don't mean we go out and repeat it and do it over and over. That's not repentant of it. But I have faith that Christ has forgiven me and will forgive me. Amen. And that's, that's my, my shield against those fiery darts. When I know, when old Satan's saying, man, Dustin, that devil, he's the sorriest thing in the world. You sorry, man, there ain't no way the Lord forgive you down. There ain't no way. That's them darts, man. Well, I have faith that Christ will and has forgiven. Amen. And that's why you use that shield. You use that shield for that. And I'm working towards the close, guys. As a matter of fact, Evan, if you want to be gathering up. Faith is complete trust. So then we take the shield. Now listen to old Samuel over in 2 Samuel 22. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield. David the writer in Psalm. Here's David. Now listen to this. David the adulterer. David the murderer. David the fornicator. David the liar. You can go on and on. I can name all kinds of things about the man after God's own heart. Listen to what he says in 28 and 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him. The Lord is my shield. See, David had a faith that, that God would forgive. Proverbs 30 and 5 says this. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Put your trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. Verse 17 of Ephesians 6 says this. It said, take the helmet of salvation. Again, that tried and true armor of God. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Salvation is deliverance from the power and the effects of sin. Y'all hear that? Salvation is delivery from the power and the effects of sin. Of course, we know the helmet covers. How easy is it to have an impure thought towards somebody? Easy? Not easy? Any, I'll take any answer right now. Right, we we got to go with this. It's real easy, isn't it? It's easy to have hatred towards somebody over something. Man, they slighted you in some way. It's easy to have an impure thought. Guys, you see a, a, a girl go through, it's real easy to have this impure thought. All those, I'm hot as fire right now somewhere. Is that over here? There you go. This helmet is meant to protect these thoughts. 
this helmet is meant because you are forgiven and because all that the Lord's done. You know, every day, guys, we need to wake up and we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Every day. Stand up. Be who you're supposed to be. Stand in the armor of the Lord and be who you claim to be. Don't back up. Don't be half-hearted. Do it. And I will guarantee this. I can guarantee this with 100%. If you will stand for Christ, you will not want the old life you had back. You will never want that old life back. If you will live a life in Christ, you'll see changes that you never thought was possible. Your attitude will change on things. Things that used to grate on you and bother you won't bother you like it did. Your life will be far simpler because you put your faith in one thing rather than your own abilities and things of the world to make you happy. And life will be simply better. And that gets me to my last part. See, our, our, the weapons that we have, the 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, let me just read it. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what that helmet's for, is reel it in. Reel it in. The thought ain't the thing. It's when you act on those thoughts that it becomes sin. Keep that in mind. And the last thing, why on earth, if we're supposed to be sissies and back up on the Lord and be careful we might offend the world blah 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 why did he give us a sword why didn't he just give us the defensive stuff and just do without the sword if we're not supposed to stand up we're going to offend at times guys your walk's going to offend people you sitting at a table across a restaurant praying is going to offend some atheists get ready they're not going to like it. I mean, I, I know of instances people, people have heard folks say, tell their kids don't look at that. They're praying a fable over there. Well, how do they know who it's praying to? Why would he give us a sword if we're supposed to back up? Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is quick and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, let me ask you something. How many can touch the soul? Can you put your hands on your soul right now? Can you put your hands on the spirit right now? Let me tell you how sharp this sword is. This sword. Let me explain how sharp it is. See, it even... Is sharp enough even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. This sword that we're talking about is supernatural. This sword is not a natural, just a, a simple metal sword. This thing can touch the soul. It can open the soul up. It can rip it asunder. It can open the soul up. It can open the spirit of a man up. And it can put a seed in there that for the next week, you might walk out of this service today, but the Lord's going to talk to you about where you stand with him. You walk out of here lost as a goose. But I guarantee you, Donnie Baker, because we've used this all morning, and I know it spoke to some people's soul, lost and found, in here this morning. And it's able to divide asunder those things. And listen to this, and it, of the joints and the marrow and the discerner of the thoughts and even the intents of your heart. The Word knows because Jesus knows. Christian, you have everything that you will ever need to walk in Christ. You'll have everything you'll ever need to walk boldly in Christ. Think about this. Gary Harris, if I can come boldly into the throne room of God, what would hinder me about being bold in front of a carnal man? If the power is there through salvation, 
for me to stand in front of God without being worried about being judged and being put to hell. Man, shouldn't I stand up to people and talk? Let them know about this Jesus? No, back up. Stand up and suit up. Very rarely do I preach in a sequence. That's just not the way he works for me. But thank God he did on this. My hands has quit shaking. I've done what I'm supposed to do. Now it's up to you. They're going to sing an altar call. It's going to be beautiful. The voices are amazing. No doubt. And I want you to be able to hear the song. I do. But I want you to listen to the still, small voice talking to you more right now. I want you to hear what he said. Are you a lost man or are you saved? What are you going to do with the scripture? As we all come to our feet, y'all go ahead, guys. Go.
outside looking in This is where grace begins We were hungry, we were thirsty With nothing left to give Oh, the shape that we were in Just when all hope seemed lost Love opened the door for us He said, come to the table Come join the sinners who have been redeemed Take your place beside the Savior Sit down and be set free Come to the table 